Well, good afternoon, and it's nice to see you here. I hope you'll enjoy what I have to share with you. It uh, was my home for a uh, little over three years. It was called the USS Biscayne. Very small ship. Matter of fact, it uh, was just about the length of a football field, 300 feet. And uh, I was looking for Bert Echelmeyer, is he here? How about Chris Hart? <laughs> All right. They're uh, relatives of uh, Ed Echelmeyer, who was our first skipper in uh, the Mediterranean. And Chris Hart, her uncle, was the skipper when we were in Okinawa. But uh, hopefully, uh, they said they would be here. As a matter of fact, my wife can attest to this. Bert called and said he was on his way. Maybe he got lost. <laughs> but um, everything that I will share with you today, I got from the uh, Office of Naval Records. And you could read it. It's like a script. If you read it, you get excited. And I was aboard this ship. And I didn't realize there were so many things that I missed. But for that reason, I'd like to share it with you and see if you can feel the same way I do. Uh, who's working? I'll work it. OK. <laughs> You're not Bert Eckelmeyer, are you? <laughs> Come on up here, Bert. I just finished introducing you and made apologies for your being late. I apologize. Uh, Bert Eckelmeyer was, was your uncle? Yes, my great uncle, my grandfather's brother. Who was a skipper of the ship through the Mediterranean. Uh, Let's move you over so you're not in front of the picture. Oh, OK. <laughs> because uh, it messes everything up. I would guess. Okay. That's your uh, super yeah. angle anyway. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Can we have the next slide? <laughs> what do we have? Nothing. Let's get let's get to the menu in 1943. There you go. Okay, can you remember those days, those of you that are the same peer as I am? Well, I, that's just to set your stage and get us uh, in on the same era. Um, Clay Worcester, he has a, an award up here from the people in Africa. He was the provost marshal, was it, Clay, in Tun Tunis? Provost marshal? Okay. We can't read it. It's in Arabic and it's in French. So if somebody can help us there, why? It's very attractive. But the reason I wanted Clay here, when the ship was in Bertherda, we had regular air raids. And I wanted to share with him just how much damage was done while we were waiting there in Bertherda to form up to make the invasion in Sicily. Uh, Dick Erb was in Okinawa. I want Dick to be the Omega. Clay will be the Alpha, as far as our program is concerned. Um, the uh, other friends I want you to meet, you met Andy Kelly. He was a captain in the Marines. Andy's still around taking pictures? No? He had to leave. He's got a commitment up in uh, Lancaster, PA. He came down from Lancaster. Uh, Gordon Clark was aboard a heavy cruiser during the Korean War. And uh, Wilmer Weber got shot down over Bastogne. Do I have that right, Wilmer? Yeah. Became a prisoner. OK. Joe Pinciotti's not here, but uh, he was also in the Air Force, but uh, with the uh, glider group. Uh, we can move on. I'm ahead of you. Yeah. You're behind me. <laughs> OK. 
officially enlisted in September of 42. Boot camp, I want to share with you the experience I had there. It was a camp that should not have been opened. Supposedly it was open for uh, our president to see, uh, Roosevelt, and uh, the food was poor, there was very little water, water to the extent when you took a shower, they turned the water off and you were loaded down with soap suds. So you had to clean your body off with a towel. Make it even worse, when you wanted to use the toilet, you didn't have any water to flush the toilet. But I lost 16 pounds there in two weeks' time. That's just to show you how bad the food was. Uh, I then was assigned to the radio school in New York. And Walter Winchell made this comment about Pier 92, which is where we were housed. He called it the concentration camp of the Navy. And I found out why one day in the chow line the fellow said to me, would you like to see what you're going to have tonight for dinner? And I said, yeah. He showed me a bill of lading of horse meat. And that's what we were having for dinner that night. But we were, I was then sent to Casablanca in North Africa, boarded this ship, the Biscayne, in Port Leote, which was in French Morocco. We were up a river guarding a, an airfield. Uh, the reason it was up the river, it took very little draft. And that was one reason why Admiral Connolly, Jack, had the ship converted to an amphibious flagship. Uh, somebody else coming in. I was discharged in November of 45. That's where I got the three years, three months, and two days. Next slide. This is the ship as a seaplane tender. That's how she was originally launched as a seaplane tender. I was never aboard the ship as a seaplane tender. Uh, when I came aboard, they had it changed to an amphibious flagship. That is, they took the superstructure back here and put a communication shack on it, a radio shack, if you will. Next slide. Uh, okay, I've given you much of that detail. The uh, armament was two five-inch guns, which were uh, very important to us during the invasions we made. In the uh, course of uh, the ship's uh, uh, operations, it did shoot down seven German planes and one and a half Japanese planes. Let's, let's stop here for a minute. Ernie Pyle came aboard in Bizerta. He wrote his first five chapters of brave men aboard the ship. I used to wake him up every morning to do our press. We had press, believe, believe it or not, every morning. But he would call out what he thought was superfluous language. But when we had a general quarters or an air raid, he would climb into his helmet. And I used to laugh at him, but I was crazy because I used to say, Ernie, you don't think shrapnel's coming through the bulkhead looking for your head. But I was foolish, because what happened one night, there was a seagoing tug got hit by shrapnel from a bomb. The bomb just hit off the beach, sieved the seagoing tug, and every guy in it was killed. We were at the tail end of that peerage, and one of our fellows sitting in a cot without any thought, anything on above his waist. Happened to be sitting there and something came through one of the refueling lines of the seaplane tender, through, the, through those two pipes, two walls of the pipe, through a bulkhead, through a transmitter, and hit him on the back. And he just casually reached around and said, oh gee, I've been hit. Well, if that hadn't been there to impede the speed of that shrapnel, he'd of course been a, been a casualty. But there were air raids every day. Photo Joe would come over during the day. We would take bets as to when we would get bombed that night. But uh, let me see, is there something else I can share with you? Oh, I used to hunt for souvenirs. And I went ashore at Bizerta, went up on a bluff, and I looked in a field, and there's two gray spots. And I can't imagine what those are. 
and went out, and there were two incendiary bombs, duds. So I screwed off the bottom of the incendiary bomb, and there was thermite in it. So I put that back together, took it back to the ship. By the same token, there's an orchard there. And I go scurrying, scavenging through the orchard, and there's some British soldiers in there working, and I didn't know what they were doing, but I saw a clip for a German rifle. <laughs> and I was about to pull it up when it's a, a mine's going to be exploded. They had put mud circles around it, which I hadn't seen. The Germans also pushed drums down wells so that we couldn't use them. They took every advantage of making life for us as miserable as possible. But uh, Ernie Powell was a great friend. He's in the ch child lines with all, the, all of us, shared uh, stories with us, uh, things that he could tell you about the Tunisian campaign. Speaking of that, when those first division soldiers came aboard the ship, it was embarrassing because they had to touch the mattresses we slept on. We had nice mattress covers. We had ice cream. We had soda. We had a place where we could go get anything we need in the way to toiletries. Just a totally different lifespan. But they preferred living on the beach, digging a foxhole, compared with us living out on a pond where we were ducks that could be easily shot. But uh, that was something that was embarrassing. The next slide is on uh, General Truscott. Oh, let's see what this is. OK, this is off of Sicily. Um, my slide, Truscott. Lucian Truscott, which is a very obscure name. Most generals are Patton, Clark, those kinds of people. But this fellow was very much involved in the invasions in the Mediterranean and in southern France. But as far as the uh, enemy planes uh, were sighted and fragmentations hitting four men, they weren't that badly injured. But we took care of people that came from the beach. There was no hospital ship. We became an auxiliary hospital ship. When the ship first dropped anchor off the beaches, the echo of the chain sliding down the side of the ship would ricochet from the beach, and the Germans would throw shells out there, hoping to hit one of the ships and light up the armada, silhouette the, the armada. The uh, searchlights that were used at, off of Sicily, nobody knew what was going to happen. They just came from out of nowhere, lit up the scene, and we thought for sure, you know, we were the target. But one by one, they blinked out. The third division, was there anybody in the third division here, or the first division? Rich in Okinawa, what division were you associated with? First Army. First Army, okay. All right, let's have the next slide, please. Oh, this is a, a, an awful shame. It was something that you'll see the next slide. Admiral Connolly sent a directive. We shot down the paratroopers' transports uh, just by accident because the German fighters were coming and bombers were coming in at the same time with the paratroopers. And the next, next day, all you saw were dead bodies floating in the water. Uh, very upsetting, but uh, fortunately we took no part in that. Supposedly it was, in addition to being involved with the German planes, it was recognition signals, which evidently weren't, weren't uh, properly uh, uncovered. And that last bit about Ernie Pyle leaving the ship with his pockets full and full stomach and what have you, he has an alcove in the uh, Pentagon set aside for him because of all the stories he wrote about the GIs during the uh, war. OK, move on. This is Truska. And I wanted you to know more about him because he's such an obscure general. Uh, he did a lot that people were not ever advised of because 
Clark and Patton got most of the headlines. Of course, when Truska uh, was landed on Sicily, and we landed Patton at the same time, he was asking for mules. And I asked Fred Werner, fellas, Fred Werner is a four-star general that came from Philadelphia, gra graduated from West Point. But I said, Fred, what do they use mules for? He said, well, they, they use them for carrying heavy armaments, and they're more sure-footed than what horses are. But there was an LST loaded with mules that he was waiting on. Now, what the Germans did, they slaughtered, before they left Sicily, all of the mules and other weight-bearing animals, so that we were short-handed that way. This is his directive. If you can read it, it's uh, self-explanatory. Probably most people can't read that. Uh. No, can't be read? Read it to them. All right, this is from Admiral Connolly to all the ships in his command. In last night's raid, over 100 men were wounded and several killed by our own fire. Most of this was avoidable considering the war experience of the ships present. The task force commander was ashamed of the poor fire discipline prevailing, which is evidence of hysteria that commanding officers alone can overcome indis indiscriminate fire merely discloses ship's positions. Do not fire low. 20 millimeter guns are the worst offenders. Again, I warn you, do not shoot at any weapon, any weapon at a plane that cannot be seen or which is out of range of the weapon. Do not shoot at flares. Instruct guns, crews, and take action to cease fire of the weapons that are firing out of control. Uh, this is to the flotilla. Group and division bank commanders are enjoined to observe ships under their command own command and in their vicinity and to take action to see that my orders are being carried out. Written by Admiral Connolly, no relation to Jack Connolly. Let me just tell you one experience I had. After an air raid, you're sort of curious as to what's going on. Well, whether you know it or not, what goes up has to come down. And I'm out there on the deck watching ACAC coming down, hitting the deck like water and hitting water like rain. No hat, no helmet, just that quickly I could have been a casualty. Also, a plane comes in, a German plane comes in strafing, and you can see our ACAC going up into him. He turns up his belly, and you can see the tracers bouncing off his belly, because that's where his armor was. But the uh, strafing and the bombing was never, was always consistent, never without it. You live with that from day to day. Okay, move on. This is something that I did witness. There was a LST offloading, and it was on the beach. A German plane came along and strapped the LST with three bombs, and the thing started to explode. Our people formed a fire and rescue, rescue party. They went over there and rescued uh, a, uh, this thing is exploding now. Saved a man with a broken leg and a seriously wounded army flyer. Now, just getting close to that was bad enough. Now, this is a, uh, the engineer, the ship's engineer. He went over there with a crew, but he commanded it and, and uh, did, they did what he proposed that they do. This also happens again later on at Salerno. He finally got a Legion of Merit for bravery. Can we move on? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The fire and rescue party is mentioned a second time. Now this time, the Germans were using glided bombs, radio-controlled glided bombs. They never missed. We were there the first day, nothing like that happened. But the second day, the ship on our port side was hit. We didn't know how it got hit. There was no general quarters. But we sent a fire and rescue party over there. They brought wounded back to our ship. And I'll tell you what I saw. One fellow was standing there. He was supposed to be clothed at all times. 
his skin was hanging off like sheets of tissue paper, and he was, <gasps> every waft there, he had a gasp for breath. Another fellow who I helped carry aboard, I thought of his insides hanging up, was his arm. They had to amputate his hand, and he asked, after that was done, can I have the lucky ring off my third finger? It sort of, you know, tore your heart out. But the second day, on our starboard side, a ship got hit, and we sent the fire and rescue party over. And again, uh, John Manry, the engineering officer, led that group of fellows. They went aboard. They needed a hand billy to get water to put out a fire. It was a British merchant ship loaded with ammunition, gasoline, and that kind of thing. They had an abandoned ship. He got the Legion of Merit for that, and there were seven of them got the Silver Star. Um, oh, we had a near, I'm sorry, go back. We had a near hurricane that drove three ships up on the beach. We didn't go up on the beach because we started our screws turning. We threw both anchors down to keep us in place. But there was a 100-bed mash where that got cleaned up. I don't know what happened to them, but just got wiped out with the force of the hurricane. But uh, that was a, a very unusual experience. We couldn't copy any radio code, all the signals. Uh, Paul and uh, Tim, it's QRM. You just couldn't copy anything. Now, when you talk about an offshore uh, hospital ship, I helped there a lot. Uh, they would come from the beach and in all kinds of conditions. I remember one uh, British uh, motorcycle brigade, when they lowered the ramp, they just, the Germans just, by the way, let me digress for a minute. The Germans knew we were coming to Salerno. We had supposedly been betrayed by somebody in Bizerta. When we got there, they were firmly entrenched, and that beachhead almost got lost. It took five days to establish the beachhead. There was talk of withdrawal. Mark Clark was considering that possibility. But fortunately, two more days, we were able to get those uh, Germans out of there. I went ashore, like I always would. I'll go back to Sicily. <laughs> I went ashore at Sicily, and I found an ammunition dump, arms and so forth. And I always carried a mailbag saying I was going to destroy confidential material, which was a ruse. <laughs> but I saw this GI there, and I said, Can I, do you have a German Luger around? He said, if you go down the road about a mile and a half, he said, you'll find a dead German officer. You can get yourself a Luger. Salerno, when I went ashore, they had just established the beachhead. I'm walking along this road, and I get thirsty, like I am right now. Can I have a? There it is, right, <laughs> right there. It's right there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I went ashore. I didn't walk too far. As a matter of fact, there was some tape up along this road, and I wanted to take a shortcut. And the MP said to me, where do you think you're going? I said, I'm going to take a shortcut. He said, yeah, to Kingdom Come. That's a minefield there. But anyway, I got back on the road, and I'm walking along, and I get thirsty. And I see a GI with his canteen. I said, how about a swig? So he takes out of its holder, <laughs> and there's nothing in it. He goes over the side of the road, nothing but dust and leaves, pushes that all aside, puts his canteen down there and fills it up, shakes it and hands it to me. I said to him, you don't want me to drink that, do you? Oh, he said, I forgot. You came from the ice cream front. Boy, did he cut my legs out from under me, because that was true. I didn't know what it was all about. But like I said before, it's a mindset. They felt safer on the beach in a foxhole compared to being out on the pond, being a duck ready to be shot out of the water. But um, we did a lot as a hospital ship. We also did other things. The, a lot of the landing craft that needed service of some kind mechanically, our people did that. Uh, fueling, water, uh, almost any service you could think of, 
there was a line of LCIs, landing craft or infantry. They were waiting for their service. But one fellow that I happened to bring aboard put on a winch. And he finally, the officer, the medical officer came to him and said, what's your problem? And he just pointed to his knee. Well, they cut the dungarees and tore it up. His knee was, knee was per absolutely perfect. And he started to shake, and this was combat fatigue. It's the first time I had seen it. We had guys run behind transmitters on the ship who lost it, and they were removed. But we didn't have too much of that. But uh, that was a very uh, peculiar experience with the near hurricane, with all the help we provided for those that were coming from the beach that needed hospitalization and also repair work, that kind of thing. All right. Oh, Hawksworth uh, wasn't a well-known British general, but that operation at Salerno was basically a British operation. But Con Connolly wanted to be a part of it. So that's how he inveigled his way, let's say, into being aboard that ship at that time. Next slide. Well, I've already discussed the fact that uh, the Germans were so well entrenched at Salerno that we almost lost the beach, and it took uh, seven days, let's say, to uh, rest them out of there and uh, establish the beachhead. And when you talk about casualties being heavy, the British mainly uh, suffered most of those uh, casualties. I think the next slide will show there was about 50%. Oh, we're back to the glide planes. <laughs> I've already told you about those. But let's... The men that arm the um, anti-aircraft guns, the Germans came down with the sun behind them. And the guys manning the guns had a look into the sun. Of course, they wore glasses, dark glasses. But when they got off, their duty their eyes were sore, just from the fact that they had a strain into the, 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 the sun. But what happened, as they described it, and that's the reason they call them glide bombs, it was a mothership up at a great height, which couldn't be reached by regular ACAC. But it would come over an anchorage, and then, like a glider, this bomb, being controlled by radio, would glide out over the anchorage, and when it would come to a target, which happened to those two ships, one on port side and one on the starboard side. We just waver, and then like somebody cut a cord, drop, and they were, they were deadly. They were so, so accurate. But what gave it away is the second ship that was hit that day was uh, this British merchant marine ship. There was a seven-foot wing spread of a plane, and that was the first indication as to what they were doing. But we built up a jammer for that, which as I mentioned before, we couldn't copy anything on the radio because it jammed everything. Oh, war, I didn't, go ahead. Anzio Annie is a, <laughs> a cannon in a, they rolled it in out of a cave. When we were off of Anzio, we couldn't ride at anchor for any length of time because if we did, they'd start to zero, zero in on you and you had to move because you were just asking to get blasted out of the water. But uh, that thing uh, scared the dickens out of us, but it never was effective as far as the ship was concerned. I have to tell you about the carrier Spartan. It was a British carrier. It was an um, anti-aircraft carrier. And it was brought in one evening into the anchorage. And at night, you don't fire because you give away your position. Well, they evidently didn't get the word because that's what they started to do when the Germans, they would come in at dusk and dawn. And it got sunk. And all you saw the next morning was a keel of the bow, brow sticking out of the water. 
I don't know how many lives were lost. But Biscayne was primary target one evening. That's an interesting experience. Uh, we would we would know when the Germans were coming in. We had two ships purposely set up a set special gear that would pick up planes coming out of Rome. We knew ahead of time that they were coming. But what they would do, we would have kids with smoke pots on the back of the LCI. They would go, go in and out of a number of ships that were assigned to them to cover them with smoke so that they couldn't be seen, even though it's night. What the Germans would do is, if they found a ship that was not covered, which we were one night, there's three white flares. And you're, you swear they're just hanging there. They don't look like they're dropping. And you can read by them. Believe me, you can read by them. Then they come back, they circle back, and then they drop three red flares. Well, one night we were it. I never thought we'd survive that, believe me. The ship did, did start to take water. One of the seams had cracked, and what our people did is they put collision mats up against those seams to keep the water from seeping in. And they sealed that somehow or other, uh, which uh, the uh, ship's crew would do, and we remained there for the rest of the operation. But that was a very exciting experience, having those flares over your head and having the Germans bomb you. This is the Spartan. That's the ship that I just told you about that got sunk. It wasn't in there you know, one day. And you felt sorry because they gave away their position. That should never have happened. But somebody just didn't get the word. Well, we just felt this would be interesting, uh, people going ashore from LCIs. But there's three generals that were at Anzio. Lucas was assigned there by uh, Clark. And Lucas gave away the edge that he had. He had a chance to move forward, but he didn't feel he had enough support in the way of men and materiel. So when he lost that and the Germans finally kept us from moving out of there, it was necessary to have him replaced by Truscott. And that's how Truscott uh, made a name for himself. All right? You can't read this either, neither can I. <laughs> OK, move forward. This is interesting, though. The Luftwaffe sent over four, th 30 fighter bombers by day and 47 at night on January the 29th. By monitoring all the Luftwaffe reef frequencies, U.S. Army fighter director teams could tell when the radio-directed glide bombs were warming up Rome and form, what and form what direction an air raid would come. They even had jamming devices and could disrupt the enemy aviators' control that guided missiles and de de direct deflect them into the water. With practice, they were almost perfect. On January the 29th, they had no, not much practice. On that night, the Germans pulled off a severe guided missile attack one of the bombs hit the HMS Spartan, which you just saw. The cruiser capsized at 19.05, which is five minutes after seven, and was a total loss. Another bomb hit a livery ship, Samuel Huntington. The crew fought the fire until 19.30, which is 7.30, when the master of ordered a van ship. Since its cargo consisted largely of ammunition and ga gasoline, at 3 o'clock in the morning, she exploded and sank. All right. This is just a note on uh, uh, Admiral Rogers. He was in India. You can read that, I think. <coughs> All right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have Dave Ward talk about reports that were made for the ship. But Admiral Rogers' report was in one of those. Uh, during all times of training and operations, the commanding officer of the and the crew of the Biscayne had performed their duties with ability, courage, and distinction. Their cooperation with the command has been both pleasant and effective. Um, they used to be in the Navy. I gave him the responsibility of just going over those 
the ACAC reports. He's seen them once before, but I thought you were impressed. Were you, Dave? Would you want to make any comment that you feel is appropriate? Our other mic isn't working so well. Okay. Everybody hear me? Yeah. You know, I will tell you something. Whether you know or not, I think this is a, an amazing record for any ship to have gone through what the Biscay did in the Mediterranean and what, four operations? Landing, peace landing operations. And then also going through the Panama Canal and getting involved in the Pacific War at both Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And if anybody, well, you all look, so you're about my age, maybe a little younger, but um, you may recall they were, particularly Okinawa, it was a terrible, terrible um, air battle. Right up the ships, this is when the uh, Japanese side in the kamikaze uh, mode where they would simply, simply fly the plane right back into a ship. Uh, going back to these particular air reports, it was interesting to me that in all cases, they, we did have radar ships, radar picket ships, even at Anzio and southern France. However, however, on the, this particular ship, um, all of the, while they knew the ships were, while they knew the planes were coming in, the ship actually picked up the aircraft visually. Now, as was already mentioned earlier by the Admiral, recognition is very, very important. And uh, towards the end of what I'm going to say, I'll tell you a little story about recognition. But um, according to the reports, the gunners tracked the planes for all of anywhere from five to ten seconds. Just clip it on your down a little further. That's it. Now, now you'll make out. Better. Yeah. Um, the gunners would visually track the planes for all of anywhere from five to ten seconds, and then the firing times, according to this varied anywhere from 5 to 20 seconds. So that's the total amount of time these gunners had to zero in and hopefully shoot the plane down. And what you say, they shot seven down and Germans, Germans and uh, three or four Japanese. One and a half, that's all right. Okay. Take the three or four. We'll, we'll, we'll credit you. <laughs> um, one other thing Stan also makes, I was talking to a friend of mine who had been an LST and a Coast Guardsman for like, uh, over in the Met, and, and he mentioned the same thing Stan did. When you were at anchor at night, there were no lights on board the ship, lights out. And if the planes did come over, you never wanted to fire, because that would give your position away, and then they would zero in on you. So if you were in the middle of a group, you didn't want to be the, shall we say, the main target of any aircraft coming around. The other aspect of, of uh, um, uh, tactics which the Germans did use, according to what I've read in here, they would generally follow American planes, perhaps coming back from someplace else. So they would follow the planes in, and so the Americans, in being aware of the American planes, all of a sudden, whoa, where did these other guys come from? Now, that takes me back to recognition. And when I was in the Navy, I had a course in recognition. It was very interesting. The instructor would stand with a slide projector. We started out, believe it or not, with studying various ship shapes of ships and planes, and we studied them. And then after a while, the, the instructor would flick a, the slide, and for, it would be on for a tenth of a second. And you think about what you're going to see in a tenth of a second. Believe it or not, at the end of the class, we were actually doing it at one hundredth of a second. It's amazing what you can pick up. 
I never forget what they said to when in those recognition classes, the first thing that comes to your mind, and that's it. Don't change your mind. You'd be amazed how fast that mind of yours reacts. And that takes me to a little story. You know, everybody, I'm sure you've seen all these military people walking around with name tags on their chest. Well, we had to wear them. And uh, on this one occasion, as the story goes, there was an indiv individual in the class who knew that if he flunked recognition, he was going to flunk out of midshipman school. So he's very much concerned. And he went into this test knowing that that was the case. Well, the instructor's there, and he says, ready? Now. And he flicks the thing on. The man writes down what he wants to say, which is normally you said, let's say, P-51 Mustang, 35 feet. That was the wingspan. P-47, Thunderbolt, 27 feet. Those were items you were supposed to write down. So he writes this thing down. And then he made the mistake. He thought he was wrong. I said, hey, you don't do that. So he erases. Well, while he's erasing that, the instructor says, ready, now. And the man had his eyes down, so he missed that one. Now he's starting to get a little nervous. Next few minutes, the instructor says, ready, now. Plane comes on. And the man's so nervous, he blinks his eye, he misses that. And finally, after four or five of these episodes, he gets more nervous and more nervous and more nervous. And he stands up and he calls the instructor every single solitary name you can think of in the book. And the instructor looked at him and says, Mister, he says, what's your name? And the guy says, ready now. <laughs> so, with that, I'll listen. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> On your tie. On my tie. Southern France. Excellent. This is a sign which says Octong Menin, which means something to me, but I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Go to the next slide. We captured a two man submarine, and I think capture is not the right word. They really came to the surface and just surrendered. There was a, an RF flyer's body that we discovered there. I went ashore again. That's where the octone minin comes from, looking for souvenirs. And uh, the first road I got on, right off the beach, was tape again. But the, this tape now said octone minin. Of course, I wasn't about to go for that tape. I figured I would step on a mine. But I walked further and there were glider traps you could see them just beyond where the minefield was they had embedded tanks wherever the road would take a turn that tank on one side of the, the curve and another on the other side so they had that completely covered but that's what i saw then i'm walking into this town and the the uh, free french pull me in off the road and they tell me that there's been a a, an episode where a woman has been raped and are looking for, we had all kinds of uh, servicemen there from different countries, French, British, American, and so on. So I spent some time with them. They were telling me how they hated the Bosch, and I listened to that for a while. And they gave me a bottle of whiskey. I didn't drink, so I took that back to the ship, and that didn't last too long when it got ashore, aboard. Okay. This is where Admiral Moosebrook comes into the picture. And I'm sorry that uh, Chris Hart couldn't be here. She wanted to be here. Um, he was also a graduate of Northeast High, as I told you, and the uh, Naval Academy. But um, we became commander of a radar picket group. They were all destroyers or destroyer escorts. And the purpose they had was off of Okinawa and Iwo Jima, they were set out by miles to form a picket fence around the objective to warn the people on the beach, Dick at Okinawa, 
if there was any surface or aer aerial craft on its way. And we would get reports of their having shot down 25 bogies, 35 bogies. It was unbelievable. But the Germans were, the Germans, the Japanese were throwing everything they could at us because we were so close now to their homeland. But uh, the things that were happening, happening on the beach was bad enough. As you know, at Iwo Jima, the carnage there was worse than what it was at uh, Normandy. Uh, there's an, a slide that we'll refer to that a little later. But uh, the, uh, the picket station ships, and I have names of three. One was Bush, another Laffey, one Morrison. They weren't there that long. When they got on the station, as soon as the weather cleared, they became the primary target, and they had no defense. And it was a shame because of the price they had to pay. Next slide. I, this was for uh, Chris Hart, because you couldn't find a picture of her uh, grandfather. But there's uh, Admiral Moosebrugger that graduated from the academy in Northeast High School. Move on. This was from an article by uh, Robert Sherrod. He mentions the uh, struggle ashore, aboard ashore, but he also talks about the uh, carnage as far as the condition of bodies, how you could dis discriminate between a Japanese and an American soldier by virtue of their leggings, that kind of thing. But the dismemberment was unbelievable. What the Japanese would do if you brought your wounded to the beach to be vacated, they would just drop shells on that beach just to make more carnage. It was unbelievable. It was nothing that was humane about this. Of course, war is not humane anyway. This is the whole article, and I won't read it for you, but uh, it tears your heart out when you realize uh, what went on then and what the conditions were. And this is, OK, I just talked about this uh, radar picket. Japs used 355 kamikazes and 341 bombers. There's the Bush and Calhoun. They were sunk. That, those are uh, radar picket ships. And then Laffey sunk in an 80-minute attack. Laffey was hit by eight, six kamikazes and four bombs plus strafing. Um, it's proverbial hell on earth. I mean, to be in that position because you. You can't defend yourself. There, there's, you're alone. Uh, you're, you're really with your hands down at your side. You can't compete with that kind of uh, air power. But uh, I just thought this would be <laughs> of a compliment of 331. You going back to that in a minute? <coughs> back to that, please. Um, Okay. 179 were rescued. 108 of the survivors that were wounded, six subsequently died. That's common for those ships that <coughs> manned those positions. I just want to use that as an example of what happened with those ships out there. This, I think, is interesting. Go ahead. Let's go through it. This is on the Navy side. I'll give you on the Army side and the other, other side of the Dick Erb, you were in Okinawa. Can you uh, at all relate to what happened there on the beach? I would like to get your opinion. I mean, did you see a lot of this? Uh, the, the thing, you know, you know time uh, does tricks to the One thing I do recall were the kamikaze attacks, which I could see from the uh, uh, mountainside uh, outside Naha. And uh, it was unbelievable. Well, we saw it with the ships that were brought into the Anchorage that had been out on picket. Uh, the superstructure just absolutely cleaned off. Uh, the, uh, the rear steerage had to be used because the wheelhouse was out of commission. But 
to share that with you, um, I wasn't a party to that except when they brought the ships in to the Anchorage. But you're, again, your heart just bled for those, you call them all, almost defensive because what they had to use was not equal to what was being used against them. They were a lost cause, uh, to say the, the least. But that's a summary of both the, from the naval side and the army side as to the price that we paid. Next. I mentioned the Legion of Merit, four silver stars, 11 Navy and Marine medals, the entire crew got a meritorious service ribbon, and the Navy was awarded the, the ship was awarded the Navy units, units citation, but the presidential unit citation, that's the top of the line. Very few ships got that kind of recognition. But that wasn't awarded, uh, so we never really got that officially, but it had been recommended. Next. Those are the campaigns. I think I've shared those with you. Uh, when you think about it, um, every operation in Europe that is in the Mediterranean, except for uh, Normandy, welcome. <laughs> uh, and then through the canal, and we talk Iwo Jima. But then the next slide, The repatriation, we, we went up into uh, Jinsen, Korea to coordinate the surrender of uh, Northern Korea. And then uh, October 13th, uh, 10th and 13th, repatriation of US and allied uh, prisoners of war in uh, China. And that's pretty much the story of the Biscayne and what I had to share aboard the ship. But it's hard to believe that it participated in so many significant uh, periods in the uh, naval war during the uh, invasions and, and in the, the Pacific. But we were lucky. Uh, the things that the ship was exposed to in the way of uh, strafings, bombings, and all the rest of it, it's uh, absolutely a miracle. Uh, Bob Dole, we called ourselves a lucky ship, but you say everybody does that. But I'm not prejudiced. <laughs> the ship was a lucky ship, but I was lucky myself to survive it. Well, one thing I didn't share with you, when the ship came to Boston after its tour in the Mediterranean, I had 92 days leave coming to me. Well, on the last week of the first 30 days, I married my partner. And uh, we, we uh, celebrated our 60th wedding anniversary in November. So for that, I'm blessed also. Now, if you have any questions, uh, maybe I've bored you, I hope not, but uh, I'd like to answer anything that I may not Stan, have. Stan, do you know when the ship was decommissioned? Yeah, it was shortly after, let's see here. I'm sorry. Didn't last long, I can't. No, no. They, matter of fact, right after it was decommissioned, they used it for target practice yeah. <laughs> in the Pacific. <laughs> and that broke your heart because it was something that was a part of you. No, no. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Stan, I might offer a comment that uh, the Navy now has, at least when I was in the Navy, uh, they now have ships specifically built to be HECs, which stands for Amphibious Group Command Ship. That's what it stands for, and they're entirely different. You were, what'd you say, a spike tender or something modified. These are wholly different and much larger. Yeah, we were a very small ship. I know that there was the Ancon and the Panamint and the several other AGCs that were like hotels uh, compared to ours. Ours was purposely appropriated by Admiral Connolly because it was small and it took very little draft. They called him close in Connolly because he wanted to be as close to the beach as he could be. And believe me, uh, <laughs> as you can tell, we were available for almost any service that, that the people on the beach would need. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed what I've shared with you because I feel it's something that you should know.
Can you tell them about your meritorious award that you got? You. Oh no. <laughs> I was staying at your thing over all those battles. You should tell them. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You have to blow your own horn. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. I, I was uh, thinking it'd be nice if we could hear a little bit about what, what you had to do with the flag communications from your ship. Uh, you well, at, at various times it was different. Sometimes it was visual. Sometimes it was by radio. Sometimes, it, uh, when I say visual, by lamp. Sometimes by flag. What my wife's referring to, I got a personal commendation award from Admiral, Far um, Admiral Moosebrugger, and it was uh, three months at one position. Uh, it was uh, a, a shift on and a shift off, and we were uh, hot sacking it. You know, you no sooner hit the bed and you had to be back on duty. But uh, I was getting rid of traffic, and the uh, uh, chief of staff was impressed because the guy that I relieved, he didn't get rid of the traffic. Uh, but that was just part of my duty. I was acclimated to it. It's just something I took in stride. But one thing I do want to share with you, we had baked beans, you know, that was a favorite, right? Well, we had those three times a day, maybe two, three times a week. But also there was a time when we had chicken that was going bad. We were getting chicken for every, every meal breakfast, lunch, and dinner until they ate up all the, the chickens. But it was awful to watch at uh, Naples, the natives begging for food. Uh, we had a garbage scow one day come up to the tail end of the ship, the fantails it's called, and we had just thrown out a lot of garbage. And then some of it was uh, sunny side up eggs. And these people are standing on the dock, reaching down, picking them out, and just scraping off the coffee grounds and eating them in front of you. Turn your stomach. We also had a box of uh, Wilson's meat, which was purple, was rotten. So they wouldn't go into the uh, garbage scow. We threw it overboard down into the harbor, and one guy stripped, put a rope around him, and dove in and brought it up, and they split that up among themselves. I mean, there were things that you had to see to appreciate how lucky you were. You know, we had dehydrated apples, dehydrated this, uh, butter that you couldn't melt with a fork, I mean, uh, spam, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it was heartrending to see how people were made to live after the Germans, you know, left them with nothing really at their disposal. I mean, the water systems, uh, sewage systems, the whole thing. I did like Naples, though. They had three castles there, one up on the hill, one down here, one in the water. This one had a moat, which was, which was dry. I went up in a finicula, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, sightseeing. But uh, that was another story. I, I was uh, bartering with a guy to buy Cameo. And the better Cameo is the one you can see the same image on the backside as you can in the front. Well, I was about to buy one of these cameos, and a voice said, that's too much. And I looked around, and I thought they were all natives, and they were, but it was a former uh, Italian aviator, and we finally became friends. And he used to take me shopping, and there were signs in shops that said, in so many words, uh, this is uh, uh, recognized as an, uh, an allied, uh, fair-dealing uh, shopkeeper. And it was baloney because he had me pick out a, a watch one time in a window, how many rows in and how many he went in. I had already priced it ahead of time, and he got it for much less than I would have. But uh, I thank you for being here. I hope that what I shared with you was informative as well as entertaining. Uh, there's a lot of things that I didn't share with you, but I thought I hit the highlights and gave you just the cream of the crop, okay? Turn the lights on back there, please.
great. Yeah? It was great. <laughs> I don't know. Remember oh, good to see you came in late. That was the late arrival. I had a meeting in the okay. main line. At, okay, I'm glad you could make it. I'm glad you could make it. I'm glad you Hi, how are you? Tonight ought to be a breeze for you. Yeah. <laughs> And I was Navy in World War II. Oh, were you really? Oh. Of course, I was in Iraq and was made weather. How about that? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank Thanks for inviting us. Saturday? <laughs> yeah, 6.30 I'll pick you up. Okay. 6.30, okay. Was it satisfactory, really? Oh, excellent. Oh, you yeah, did excellent. a fine did job. Fine job. Yeah. Proud of you. Yeah, well, we're proud of you, young man. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't have a dry run seat, <laughs> and that's what got I was mad. This, huh? the dry <laughs> this is for tonight. You're, you'll be in good you'll shape. Be fine, <laughs> fine. I'm going to see Bruce Hussle. You're done. Hi, Jake. We don't have it. You're yeah. working your way to the front. I got my pictures up there. Oh, do you? About five years ago when I tried to convince you to come here. You should have done. I should have done. I should have done. I should have done. Okay. Yeah, I have a lot of interesting tales. Thank you.